Hi, everyone. So thank you so much for um, showing up to the fourth installment of the Arctic um, Science and Technology Series put on through the MIT Alumni Club of Norway. And I am super, super excited to introduce Alina Baikova, who is actually someone that I met on Svalbard um, two, two falls, two Octobers ago, actually probably around this time she and I met in Svalbard. And ever since then, I've been like a massive fan of her, her written work. Um, and I just am really excited to hear her talk today. So Alina is a senior associate and the editor in chief at the Arctic Institute. She's also a research fellow at the North American and Arctic Defense and Security Network or NADSEN. And she holds, she is also a PhD candidate um, in history at Stanford University, and her research looks at transnational Soviet and Arctic environmental history with a focus on resource extraction and the Cold War. Alina earned her master's in European and Russian affairs from the Monk School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the University of Toronto in, in 2019. Her master's thesis was about the rise and fall of Soviet mining settlements in, on Svalbard. And prior to her work in academia, she completed a Bachelor of Journalism at Toronto Metropolitan University and worked as a breaking news reporter at the Toronto Star, Canada's largest newspaper. So I am just so excited to um, hear what she has to say about the origins of Svalbard geo uh, security. So Alina, over to you. Hi, thank you so much. Um, let me just share my screen super quick. Thank you so much to the organizers and thank you everyone. Uh, for being here. I'm very excited to tell you about my research. Um, can everybody hear me okay? I'm going to assume that that's a yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, so my dissertation research deals with Svalbard, which is um, an archipelago in the Norwegian Arctic, about 700 miles or 1,000 kilometers uh, from the North Pole. I chose this photo as the sort of cover photo for this talk because I think uh, this is the main settlement of Longyearbyen. It's a view of one of the streets. Um, and I think it sort of captures what I want to talk about quite well because this brown building here is uh, UNIS, the University Center on Svalbard, which is sort of the main research hub there these days. Um, however, if you look at this fenced area over to the right here, this is where there used to be a... Nazi gun emplacement in World War II, and it's now a protected site. And I find that really interesting because it sort of captures the layers of history here as they relate to politics and science, which is what I want to talk about more today. Um, yeah, so as I said, here is Svalbard. It's in the North Atlantic. Uh, throughout my research, I've been asking myself, why does Svalbard matter? Why? What makes it special? Why should we care about it? And I think there's a lot of different ways to answer that question, obviously. Um, but one of the answers can be found in World War II and the sort of geostrategic changes the Arctic went through since then, uh, which are still relevant today. So my research looks at the history of resource extraction on Svalbard and how competing na transnational interests in the region interacted with environmental factors and macro level political forces. Um, and I think World War II is a great case study to look at Svalbard geopolitics at the nexus of environment and politics. Uh, World War II and the early Cold War tensions that followed were also pivotal to the um, an evolving understanding of the Arctic as a strategic space, especially as the region became more militarized. In the context of Svalbard, this meant that a group of islands that were very much seen as irrelevant by most of the diplomatic community prior to World War II um, became a point of disagreement between Norway and the Soviet Union uh, before the war even ended. And you can still see legacies of this today if you just look at recent news headlines, for example. So how did this come about? Historically, Svalbard played host to numerous national interests. Uh, the British were there, the Americans were there, the Dutch were whaling, there was French interest, um, some Basque interest as well, uh, Swedish, German, and Norwegian and Russian interest as well throughout the centuries. Um, so it was used as a hunting and whaling ground by many European states. Uh, in the sort of early uh, 20th century, coal mining became sort of a big craze there. Um, and then it came under Norwegian sovereignty with the Svalbard Treaty of 1920, um, which allowed, which put the islands under Norwegian sovereignty, but allowed the other signatory states of the uh, treaty, of which there were initially 12 states, to carry out economic activities on a footing of absolute equality. 
However, this Article 9 that is here um, says that Svalbard can never be used for warlike purposes under the Svalbard Treaty, and this becomes especially relevant during World War II. Um, and in World War II, the situation was arguably no different. The national actors who had been present in the area were still present there, uh, specifically the Norwegians, the British, the Russians, and the Germans, and they had diverse national interests. So Nazi Germany was interested in Svalbard because the military leaders uh, wanted weather data for their various campaigns on the European mainland. And since most of Western Europe's weather originates in the North Atlantic, um, they set up numerous secret weather stations on ships in the area and also on the eastern coast of Greenland and on Svalbard. So I'm not a meteorologist and it was really difficult to find a a weather map that shows sort of how the air moves. But if you take a look at this one, you can see that these purple and blue fronts here indicate how air is flowing down from the Greenland and Svalbard sort of North Pole, North Atlantic area down to Western Europe. Um, this becomes much more relevant during the war. The German used weather data to plan massive maneuvers, um, such as the invasion of France, the bombings on London, and the June uh, 1941 attack on the Soviet Union, as well as other campaigns. And you can see on this map here, the black dots indicate where and during which years they had secret weather stations set up in this North Atlantic region. Meanwhile, the Allies weren't particularly interested in Svalbard at all until Germany turned on the USSR. And suddenly the maritime passage between Svalbard and Northern Norway here uh, between the mainland and Bear Island became critically important for supply convoys and communications with Northern Russia. Up until this point, affairs on Svalbard had proceeded as normal. Uh, Norway and the Soviet Union, which were the only two major actors there, they continued coal mining peacefully even while um, war was unfolding on the mainland. And despite the fact that Germany had invaded Norway in spring 1940, the Soviet leadership on Svalbard expressed concern to the USSR's leaders um, in Moscow in 1940 that their interests on Svalbard could be threatened if Germany or the British decided to take over the islands, but little was done about it. Fast forward to summer 1941 and weather and reconnaissance in the region suddenly mattered very much. Uh, because they needed to know the ice extent north of Norway so allies could send convoys as far as possible from the northern Norwegian mainland, which was heavily fortified by German aerial and naval bases. At this point, the Soviets began to urge British military leadership to take over Svalbard, which they saw as a critical move to help liberate northern Norway and assure, ensure the safety of the northern fleet, uh, which was based in Murmansk. And the British were initially interested in the Soviet proposal to occupy Svalbard and potentially use it as an aerial and naval refueling base. But after reviewing the plan, they realized that this would be difficult and impractical. So for starters, the Ice Fjord, a major waterway in, in the central island of Spitsbergen on Svalbard, um, was about five to 10 miles wide in some areas, which would make it difficult to fortify against uh, German submarines. Furthermore, Svalbard's inner fjords are icebound for more than half of the year sometimes, and the region's dark for four months straight in the polar night. Uh, but on the other hand, it also gets the midnight sun in the summer, so it has 24-hour daylight, which would leave allied bases there open to constant enemy attack. Um, <clears throat> apologies. Um, there were also significant issues with Arctic operating conditions. To consider, so it would be impossible to land planes on Svalbard in the summer, for example, um, because the ground is made of spongy permafrost, uh, and building gravel landing strips would attract enemy attention during the 24-hour daylight. Float planes could be used to land in the fjords for a handful of months of the year, but only when the water was free of pack ice, and that could be a bit difficult to predict. Uh, so considering all of these dif difficulties, the British War Cabinet declared in August 1941, quote, that there is no military advantage in establishing a garrison on Svalbard, which upset the Soviets. Despite Soviet complaints, um, it was decided that a force of British, French, Norwegian, and Canadian troops would go to the islands at the end of August and raise the coal towns to the ground to deny the 500,000 tons of Svalbard coal, which was mined there annually to the Germans. So the Allies at this point were less concerned about the German weather stations and more concerned about keeping coal out of German hands to fuel their war effort. 
This in turn upset the Norwegians, especially local leadership on Svalbard who were running the Norwegian mines, who worried that destroying them would cause them to flood with water and it would take years to restore them after the war, um, which would hurt the Norwegian economy, especially in Northern Norway, which is where the coal was primarily going. Uh, the British plan won out, however, in that moment, despite some protest from Norway and the USSR. And over the course of about a week, uh, Norwegian and military Soviet towns were destroyed and the coal burnt. And 2,000 Soviet miners and their families were evacuated to Arhangelsk, while 800 Norwegians were sent to Britain. Uh, while the Norwegians, both the ones on Svalbard and the national leadership that was in exile in London, agreed to the plan eventually, the Norwegian foreign, foreign Affairs Minister later complained to the British government that too much force was used in the destruction of the Norwegian town, Longyearbyen, and more damage was done than necessary, and the Norwegians eventually asked for financial compensation to sort of help with this. Um, meanwhile, the Allied move to destruct everything on Svalbard didn't particularly stop the Germans from coming to Svalbard. Just weeks after the Allied towns were evacuated in late September um, 1941, a German force arrived and set up a weather station in the area of Longyearbyen, which was now abandoned. Um, and a few weeks later, in October, an Allied reconnaissance flight scared off the Germans, and a fleet of Allied ships came and destroyed all of their equipment. But then they came back very quickly after that, in early November, and set up another weather station, which indicates a lack of capacity by both German and Allied powers to spare enough resources to effectively control the area. Uh, what followed was years of attrition warfare. So in early 1942, a group of influential Norwegians in London pressured the British military leadership to send a small force of men to the region to maintain the mines there. And this force was mostly made up of Norwegian miners. Um, but it took months to gather the men and the equipment to actually go. They were struggling to find very basic things like boats to sail to Svalbard, um, which also indicates that these vital war resources were tied up in sort of more significant theaters of war and that Svalbard was very much seen as being at the periphery of sort of the European theater of war. So not a lot of resources were being allocated to things there. When this force finally got to Svalbard in mid-May 1942, they were attacked by German planes and the men who survived hid in the abandoned Soviet mines until they could be evacuated some weeks later. Then in early June 1942, the British uh, sent enough men and supplies to establish a small garrison of about 100 men, mostly Norwegians on Svalbard, which remained there for the rest of the war, despite frequent attacks by German forces. Meanwhile, the Germans continued to build weather stations in the same area, uh, in more remote parts of the archipelago especially. Most of them were found and destroyed by allies, but one survived the war and the people there, um, they didn't surrender until August 1945 when a ship was finally sent from northern Norway to collect them because they had difficulty establishing weather uh, radio communication with the mainland to explain to them exactly where on Svalbard they were hidden. So people did not find them until August. That's how well hidden this station was. Um, so this ongoing Nazi effort to establish weather bases in the remote and inhospitable region, even in the final months of the war, I think underscores the perceived importance of Arctic weather data for the Nazi war effort. So at the end of the war, the world's northern powers had arguably undergone a paradigm shift. The Arctic, which was previously seen as an empty and largely sort of isolated and useless region, uh, would grow in importance in the following decades. In the context of Western Soviet relations, the reasons for this were varied. First of all, Western nations during the war came to realize the utility of northern weather data for both military and civilian purposes, and this German sort of effort to establish weather bases in the north helped with that a lot, um, as seen here from this uh, policy statement from the U.S. Department of State in 1951. Um, second of all, actors on both sides of the brewing Cold War understood that the fastest way to bomb their enemies would be to fly planes and then later missiles over the Arctic. And the Soviets responded to U.S. interest in Greenland and Iceland by setting their sights on part of Svalbard. Thirdly, during the war, the Soviets um, had seen firsthand how important the naval passage between Svalbard and northern Norway was. Um, and as more attention and money was invested into the northern fleet in Murmansk, the security of the Barents Sea region became critically important. Um, right. And um, 
the, this motivated the Soviet leadership to start pressuring the Norwegians uh, to divide Svalbard between them and rewrite the Svalbard Treaty as early as 1944. Meanwhile, tensions were brewing elsewhere in Europe. Uh, Soviet aggression in what would become its Euro Eastern European satellite states worried Western leaders and contributed to the creation of NATO. Um, and meanwhile, while Norway seemed initially receptive to renegotiating the Svalbard Treaty to maintain good relations with the Soviets and show gratitude for their contribution in liberating Northern Norway, the German invasion had also unequivocally changed Norwegian foreign policy, pushing it from neutrality closer to the West. Um, so these were sort of the two main actors after the end of um, World War II in this sort of Svalbard renegotiation affair. Uh, Norway's Western allies were concerned about Soviet interest in Svalbard, remarking that if the Soviets managed to build bases there, it would be possible for them to strike targets uh, in the U.S. five to ten years earlier than planned. And from the start, Norwegian military leadership was concerned about the threatening tone that the Soviet Commissar of Foreign Affairs, Vyacheslav Molotov, took when addressing the Svalbard question. However, they were inclined to initially play nice. In the first years of the renegotiation, the Norwegian government followed a policy of bridge building, trying to maintain decent relations between both the West and the Soviets. Um, so they were sort of stuck in a rock and a hard place between Western pressure to like, avoid the Svalbard renegotiation and Soviet pressure to do that. Um, Western policymakers initially did not very strongly oppose the Soviet attempts to gain ground on Svalbard. Um, this British document from the war cabinet basically says that um, there's no strategic use for the UK of Svalbard and that if the Russians were there, it wouldn't particularly threaten them and it wouldn't be a big deal. Um, but this is 1945 and we can see in the documents that as the Cold War ramps up, the attitude towards this begins to change. Um, American officials, especially during this time, pointed out that protesting the Soviet move on Svalbard could cost them unimpeded access to Greenland and Iceland. So they were, there were many different diplomatic and political forces at work here that shaped policy towards the Svalbard renegotiation on a sort of international level. As early Cold War tensions continued to rise, however, a new leadership took over the Norwegian government uh, in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Uh, under Halvard Hal Hal Lang, and they took a harder stance towards the Soviets from 1947. And this change in Norwegian policy also coincided with um, rising issues on the European, sort of the main continent, and the rise of Truman's doctrine of containment in the US, which affected the American view of, Svalb of the Svalbard question and prompted them to advise against Norway giving any ground on the matter since ceding territory on Svalbard could be seen as appeasement. In 1947, the Norwegian parliament effectively rejected the treaty renegotiation with the USSR, uh, saying that since the Svalbard Treaty had over a dozen signatory states, all the parties to the treaty would need to be consulted before any changes could be made. So they did not want to negotiate with the Soviets on a bilateral level. They were trying to push it in a multilateral level to bring in other signatories, which were essentially their Western allies primarily. On the Soviet side, the leadership also backed off because they realized that if they divided Svalbard in half and militarized part of it, uh, Norway and its Western allies could easily build bases on the other half as well, putting them in close striking distance of Moscow. So Norway's joining of NATO as a founding member in 1949 was sort of the final nail in the coffin for the possibility of friendly Norwegian-Soviet relations. And that completely, you'd think that this would completely put this issue to rest. Um, however, Sval the Svalbard issue, while it had been abandoned by the Soviets, continued to crop up over the decades in um, British military documents, in American sort of Department of State and Planning documents, even in the Central Intelligence Agency like this. Um, this report didn't rule out the possibility of putting Svalbard um, military in infrastructure on Svalbard in the future stating the location of Svalbard gives it a potential strategic value as a site for facilities, guided missile emplacements, weather and Loran stations, and um, what does that say, radar posts. Um, however, it also states that the environmental factors would render it usable for only a few months of the year. And it also noted that the Soviets would be, quote, unlikely to abandon this observation post from which they can keep a watchful eye upon the activities of other nationals there. Um, 
Additionally, NATO's Arctic policy relied on Svalbard and Greenland experiences in World War II. So in the 1950s and 60s, Alliance leadership, according to historical documents, feared that the Soviets might repeat actions taken by the Germans, such as setting up secret weather bases in remote Arctic regions. And NATO advisors reported to the leadership that the patrols that patrols of Greenland's eastern coast and the Norwegian north should be set up and that Iceland should be fortified to deter a potential Soviet attack or an attempt to take it over and that uh, the alliance needed to remain vigilant for large numbers of submarines moving westbound from the Soviet Union. NATO leadership also named several regions of the Arctic, including the North Atlantic, among the highest risk regions where enemies might attempt to undermine the West. And as we've seen, World War II and the evolving military and scientific technologies changed the perception of Svalbard from a group of frozen Arctic islands in the remote north to a strategic base that had a lot to offer numerous powers, from access to valuable scientific data to a potential location for military bases for striking Cold War enemies. Uh, this realization would come to define Soviet foreign policy uh, towards the Barents region throughout the Cold War and was a major consideration in the Soviet buildup of the Northern Fleet in Murmansk. And while the Soviet Union had plentiful coal on the mainland, the government continued to finance mining settlements on Svalbard, as the Russian government continues to do today, indicating a policy-oriented goal of staying vigilant and maintaining a presence on the islands in case there's ever a, it's ever useful in a conflict situation. So World War II and subsequent advancements in military technology changed the political and strategic understanding of the Arctic as a space. And in the case of Svalbard, this can very much be seen in headlines today, like the ones I mentioned at the beginning. So this, I think, shows that the Svalbard-like World War II legacy is still very much alive and well, and it has come to sort of define Svalbard affairs in many ways. And I'm very eager uh, to hear your thoughts. Thank you so much for listening. Alina, thank you so much for such an interesting presentation and also really bringing um, diplomatic history and military history into the series. I think it's a really excellent perspective to kind of um, inject into our larger understandings of the Arctic and environment and technology. So it's really exciting to kind of hear about this one little pocket of the globe. And so I, of course, have like a thousand questions for you, but I'm going to start with one, which is, can you speak a little bit more about this demilitarized status? I know that it came out of the um, the Treaty of Versailles at the end of this, uh, at kind of the resolution of the World War One. but I was wondering if you could speak a little bit more about what that meant at the time and why it was happening. And the other question too, is when I think of demilitarized statuses, I think of Antarctica. And so I'm just kind of, if you could speak a little bit more on that kind of contention in international law and relations. Yeah, totally. Um, do you want me to stop sharing my screen? <laughs> or should, okay. Um, yeah, thank you so much for the very interesting question. Um, yeah, so the de you're completely right. The demilitarized status came out of um, World War I. It was, as some scholars have called, a product of Wilsonian politics, um, you know, where there was an, a need after World War I to sort of demarcate which territorial boundaries are where um, and sort of, yeah, divide different parts of the world that were maybe a little bit unclear at the time in a sort of very Western imperial like perspective um, to prevent war in the future, essentially. And as we saw, this didn't exactly work and Svalbard was drawn into war stuff again. Um, but yeah, the the Svalbard Treaty is definitely, it was, it was signed at Versailles and it was a product of all of that. Um, <clears throat> I think the Svalbard Treaty in itself is very interesting. I'm not a legal scholar, but I feel like um, the sort of, how do I put this? Um, there's so many questions in the media today. And our colleague, Andreas Ostagen, for example, is very active in trying to combat sort of misconceptions about Svalbard. Because lots of people seem to think that because Svalbard, because of the Svalbard Treaty, Svalbard is not like inherently in Norwegian territory and somehow shared. So maybe people have a misconception that it's similar to Antarctica. Um, but that's completely not the case because Article 1 of the Svalbard Treaty, as we saw in my little slideshow, um, says that, you know, 
Svalbard is inherently Norwegian territory and it's under Norwegian sovereignty. Um, yeah, and I think that this creates a lot of tension because then you have actors like the Soviet Union, for example, who are there, who can use their presence in the region as leverage to sort of push Norway, but they don't inherently have rights beyond economic rights on Svalbard. Um, yeah, so I think that creates a lot of really interesting things that we can talk about. No, it's a really fascinating question of interpretation of the treaty and also implementation of it. And so it's really, if you read the, um, the Svalbard Treaty, it talks very specifically about fortifications and it talks, I think it talks about um, harbors and like other kind of, but that's as far as it goes as to what's demilitarized. And so it seems like the, the meteorological stations are interesting because they can kind of be both, right? They could be militaristic and they could be kind of used for, a, you know, kind of non-military activities. And so it seems like that ambiguity and definition actually plays into a lot of these um, conflicts and then also um, acts, as you were saying, as this kind of negotiation point and a means of making these larger political points. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's, I find that to be really, really fascinating about it. But I also want to ask you, and, and you had brought this up in your last question, or last answer about these kind of public understandings of what Svalbard is. Um, it is my understanding that recently there have been more and more kind of friction activities on Svalbard between the Norwegians and the Soviet, and the, Soviet the, um, the Russian kind of Russian activities. And so if I remember correctly, there is their Russian, like the Russian government maybe created like a, a memorial to soldiers or they had like a, so they had a parade, like kind of a nationalistic parade. Um, they're also, there are also uh, instances of uh, US and Turkish satellites being denied access, like ability to operate because those, that technology is seen as, um, as kind of potential for militaristic reasons. There's also the example of a Russian citizen, I believe, who is, a, who is, who was forced off the island because they were seen to be a spy. So I'm curious about kind of what the public understanding of Svalbard is and how that's then used for like political ways or political reasons, both then and now. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, well, I guess to speak about the military thing for just two more seconds, um, this concept of militarizing or not militarizing like you can see that as well in some of these Department of State documents, for example, from the 1950s, some of these British war documents from the same time where um, either in the 50s, after the Svalbard Treaty renegotiation had been laid to rest, there were lawyers and people in the government in Britain, Norway and the US that were asking, like, can we arguably say that World War II is still ongoing to put military bases on Svalbard and say it's like a condition of war essentially um, <laughs> and there was like this correspondence back and forth where there was debate about like can we can we somehow stick bases there to sort of pressure moscow and like make life more difficult for them um and the consensus was essentially no because that'll really aggravate the soviets and we don't want that um yeah and this militarization question keeps coming up over and over again because like you mentioned with the satellites like what is what counts as military, you know, the, the, the thing with the, the Turkish denial, you know, does that count as military? Um, that also gives the Russians today leverage to kick up a fuss, for example, when the Norwegian Coast Guard comes by or when a NATO delegation comes by or when someone else comes by on their way to the North Pole to do like science stuff up there, you know? Um, so yeah, I feel like that's really interesting. And it's probably, you know, in the Russian best interest in many ways to keep that ambiguity about the Svalbard status, because that gives them leverage to say, we have rights here, we have a historic presence here. Um, and throughout history, many times it's come up that the, like the, the Russians slash the Soviets sort of felt that they'd been cheated in the first place, considering that they were not at Versailles, they had a separate agreement with Germany, so they were not at that negotiating table. And they see sort of the Svalbard Treaty as capitalizing on the unrest in the Soviet Union during the Russian Revolution, um, which cut them out of their sort of historic claim to Svalbard. However, um, I am going to jump in and say Article 10 of the Svalbard Treaty does essentially give the, the Soviets, like they say the Soviets have essentially the same rights um, until they sign it. 
right? So I mm-hmm. think that is something that always gets me because I totally understand, you know, I because they're it's they're still in there, right? And then I mm-hmm. guess they don't ratify it until 25, 35? 35, 35. 35, because I think the US had to recognize them as a state or something. Anyway, sorry, I did, totally didn't mean to cut you no, off. No, <laughs> no, no, you're all good. Yeah, no, I think there's just a lot of the Svalbard... There's just a lot of legal interpretations, as you say, that are like super interesting. And there's a lot of sort of questions that can be asked about like how encompassing the Svalbard Treaty is and what exactly it pertains to and like how much flexibility there is in it, essentially. I really appreciate that that answer. And it's so interesting to look at the, the legal ambiguities and how you know, how that kind of plays out in terms of this political, um, this political dialogue, but, oh my gosh, (laughs) but also how it plays out in terms of um, the political messaging that's being enacted because of this, because of um, activities on Svalbard. So something that I look at in my own work is how once the Russia, once the Soviet um, bid to kind of share those capacities on Norway that started in like 1944 and then ended around what 1947 is that when it's uh, yep and that's actually happening at the same time that Norway is talking about joining NATO once in 1950 once Norway has joined NATO and NATO is a thing now they actually bring Svalbard into the northern command Mm -hmm. and that is very and as you know of course but that is very much um defensive in terms of like it's in it there are documents in the NATO in the NATO archive that talk about how the if if needed there could be they, we could set up bases there. There's no certain that they don't do it, of course. Mm-hmm. But the Soviet Union actually takes the fact that it's in the Northern Command at all, and takes the fact that nor and uses that as a public criticism of the organization that it's being inherently aggressive. And in a series of like different diplomatic notes that are sent and then made public in, I think it's October and November of 1951 or 1952, I don't, I forgot the exact dates. Mm-hmm. Um, the, Nor- the the Soviet Union is using the fact that now there's going to be, now that Norway is part of NATO territory, and now that Norwegian territory they're assuming is going to be militarized, thus by extension, Svalbard's going to be militarized. And that's actually one of the largest pieces of evidence the Soviet Union uses at that time to say that NATO is a breach of international law. And mm-hmm. so it's so interesting to me that this ambiguity and this kind of um, this place that is so isolated and so undefined and kind of public understanding is being used as evidence of kind of denigration of um this new organization so sorry to go off of my soapbox for a second but i find that so interesting i mean do you see anything happening more on svalbard going forward like what do you see kind of the future of svalbard as and is Uh it like would it be a good military base (laughs) that's a great question um yeah i mean the, regarding the NATO, the Soviet Union sort of NATO like relationship, I feel like from the very start, the Soviets were yelling that because NATO is created outside of the United Nations, it's inherently fraudulent, um, etc. You know, so yeah, the I feel like they're grasping Svalbard as leverage to contribute to this, but I think they're reaching for like so many different reasons, and they're just freaking out about it essentially if you look at um media coverage in i don't know if it's media coverage exactly speaking as a former journalist but if you look at media articles in the soviet union during the time right before nato was formed and right after there's a lot of sort of discussion about um like how bad NATO is essentially and how awful the West is and just it's I think it's just a symptom of like ramping up Cold War tensions to a certain degree um what can you repeat the second part of your question I'm so sorry <laughs> I feel no like I it's no problem <laughs> what I what's, mean, the oh, what's the future of Svalbard what's the future amongst <laughs> yeah yeah I'm sorry um yeah the the second half of your question is great I think you know I don't think Svalbard matters that much for military bases these days military technology is so advanced that you can fire missiles from siberia and they'll you know land wherever russia wants them to land pretty quickly 
from what I understand. I'm not a military expert, but that's sort of the the gist that I get. Um, so Svalbard, from a strategic standpoint, I think probably did not matter as much as a missile base from like the second half of the Cold War. Um, that being said, I think it's still very important in the sense that that naval passage between Northern Europe and Bear Island slash Svalbard um, is critical for the Northern fleet and whoever controls the, those waters is going to have an upper hand if there's a war between the West and the Soviet, uh, the Russians, not the Soviets. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the future of Svalbard, though, the most pressing and immediate sort of stuff going on there is probably sort of the Norwegian, like, what Norway wants Svalbard to be, because they're, you know, they're, they've, they've, people have been asking questions for a few years now about, like, how Norwegian is Svalbard when half of Svalbard is foreign nationals? Um, should foreign nationals be allowed to vote? And there was that whole debate back in last year when they were taking away the right to vote from um, people who were not Norwegian. Um, so I think there's that side of things. I think there's also the environmental side of things where stuff like things are sliding down hills. Permafrost is thawing. There's more rainfall. There's avalanches. Like there's all sorts of you know, really pressing issues happening up there in real time that need to be mitigated and addressed. The very sort of makeup of the islands is changing. Glaciers are melting, which is carving the island of Spitsbergen into two separate islands. So within like 30 years, that island is no longer just going to be one island. It'll be two. Um, mm. What does that mean for Svalbard, essentially? Um, so I think these are the most sort of important issues that need to be discussed. <laughs> Well, and I think that actually uh, that that be leads beautifully into a question um, that is that is in the chat, which is the question of the enforcement of order. So, who currently plays the de facto role of the person who, or, or kind of the entity that is um, maintaining order on the island? Uh, when there's an incident, what actually happens behind the scenes? Which ministries, which countries get involved in the potential? And like how much do the signatories actually have say over how the the island is the archipelago is governed or is it all kind of norwegian sovereignty essentially mm -hmm. i mean to my knowledge it's norwegian sovereignty um the governor of svalbard is under to my understanding the norwegian justice department and has been from the very start um and you can see in the sort of correspondence in the government that the Governor primarily deals with the Justice Department um, throughout the sort of 20th century and probably even now. Um, yeah, I think, you know, prior to the 1970s, Norway was still sort of enforcing the island, but it was I, it was under Norwegian sovereignty for sure. But that sort of hint of like no man's land, I would say, was still around in the sense that the Norwegians were very lazy fair about what happened on Svalbard. They were not equipping their people there with um, like especially useful materials. The governor was getting around on skis and with a sled dog. Um, yeah. The Meanwhile, the Soviets had a bunch of helicopters. Um, and But after the 1970s, with new environmental laws and with increased funding, the Norwegians sort of started asserting themselves a lot more um and i think to this day they're very keen on indicating that while maybe they are willing to listen to input it's still very much norway that's in control of svalbard and that's like a very big point for them to drive home especially at a time like now where russia's just sort of pushing boundaries wherever it can i think well it seems like that that Svalbard is also a symbol, right? It's symbolism too. It's this kind of place that has like historically been um, a push and pull of kind of influences and presence and, and politics and things like that. So um, on that note, I just want to thank you so much for what a fascinating presentation. Um, and we've put a lot of, we put your publications in the chat. So if people are interested, they can read more about this. And uh, I just want to thank you so much. And Phil is going to conclude for us. Yeah, thank yeah. You. Thank you, Alina, for um for joining us from the West Coast, and and even though you're uh, a little under the weather today, thank you so much for uh, sticking out for us. Um, so um, what we will do is uh, 
just to do a quick update on the schedule coming up because we do have a little adjustment. Um, the the October end of October session for for uh, Songke Mararen is going to be rescheduled to end of November, um, as he just got relocated back to Germany from Finland. So that is the slight schedule we have uh, changing the schedule we have. So the next coming up, the the next session coming up will be the um, the one from Ben Evans. Um, who's at the MIT Lincoln Laboratory, who will talk about the, the latest development of their sensor network technology in the Arctic, uh, which is going to be very informative for those who are interested in the, um, the prospect of building a better domain awareness capability. Um, yeah, so October 29th, uh, Hope you guys can join us. And uh, with that, we will um, close the session. Thank you. Thank you so much.